This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being. Being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Dr. Shannon South's work is for spiritually minded entrepreneurs or those wanting to start their business and achieve their highest potential. By using the wisdom and time tested approaches of spiritual psychology, Dr. Shannon guides you through the three stages of consciousness and how to align with the strengths of these for maximum abundance, joy, and success. Valeria Tellez interviews Dr. Shannon South the author of Grow Your Business by Growing You, the spiritual entrepreneur's guide to maximum abundance, joy, and success. Dr. Shannon D. South, aka The Joy Doctor, is an award-winning therapist, an Amazon best-selling author, and an inspirational speaker. As an expert in the field of spirituality and healing trauma for over 20 years, she knows how to assist people in finding wholeness and joy naturally. In 1994, Shannon had a spiritual experience during meditation that healed her debilitating anxiety and depression permanently. Since this transformative experience, Shannon has helped thousands of clients connect to their most loving, abundant, and joy-filled selves. Shannon is the founder of the Ignite programs and Grow Your Business by Growing You Breakthrough Day. She is a sought-out international trainer and coach helping spiritually-minded entrepreneurs break through what is standing in their way from abundance, joy, and success. Shannon loves dancing, being in nature, and a rowdy game of volleyball. For a free discovery call to see how she can help align you with your highest potential, go to drshannonsouth.com. Here is the interview with Dr. Shannon South. In your own words, who is Shannon South? Oh boy, what a great question. Um, I believe I am an activist for peace, joy, and love. I uh, really believe in healing and tapping into our highest potential and our ability to do that and grow through what we are challenged with. I love people deeply and dearly and loyally and like to have a lot of fun. I love being in nature and love working with people and transformation. The title of your book is Grow Your Business by Growing You. I love that because it makes so much sense. And the subtitle is The Spiritual Entrepreneur's Guide to Maximum Abundance, Joy, and Success. Woohoo! I know. So (laughs) (laughs) the feeling I get from speaking to you, it reflects all that what you uh, write about and what your message is. So that's wonderful. But I do have some questions to clarify some words. We are using words. So to be spiritual, what is it? Mm. Well, I've been called a mystic before, Mm -hmm. but uh, (laughs) I didn't even know what it was when I was called that. But there's lots of ways to be spiritual, but definitely a lover of something, a lover of poetry or God or higher power or a lover of relationships that are good and healthy and just, um, a lover of nature, a lover of something that's bigger and wiser and maybe our wiser self, but uh, definitely a lover of something positive and good for us. So my next word to explore is success. How do you define success? What is to be successful to you? Mm, Good question. So success can come in many forms. You know, I love the saying, you know, what I desire, I acquire. 
However, it's not always that simple as we know, right? Sometimes the most spiritual path is when we don't, de- don't get something we desire that, that we want to acquire and the lessons in between A to Z, right? So, so it's both. It's an and both. I believe um, it's, a, it's our journey to becoming, um, becoming who we are, who we're meant to be and how we use that journey mm-hmm. for good. It implies getting somewhere, <laughs> doesn't it? You know, it does. It being does. who you are and all that. Yes. So uh, do you believe in a destination, getting somewhere and staying there? Well, you know what? We are energy in motion. So um, I believe we have to move energy. We have to move things that are blocks to our success or blocks to our growth um, that are in our way. We have to... Um, absorb and transform our challenges in a way that help us to grow to a next level. Is there a final destiny? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I really don't. All I know is that there are, there's, yeah. there are lots of models and pathways that allow us to increase our consciousness and experience more of our soul. So um, if we want that, and that's something we desire, we want to grow towards our soul's calling for us, that nudges us, that calls us, that pulls us, then we can. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. So as a far as a final destiny, I have no idea. I know mm-hmm. coming home to ourselves is a big one, right? Mm-hmm. You know, our most authentic self, but that can, that can grow and change too, right? I love my favorite quote by Dr. Carl Jung. He's one of my uh, mentors, you know, he's, he's clearly not alive anymore, but he always said, only that which changes remains true. Mm-hmm. And I believe that. That is interesting because that contradicts some of the um, spiritual teachings from some respected entities who walked this earth, that quite the opposite, that what is real doesn't change. Oh, you know what? I think it's an and both mm. because I think he's talking psychologically and spiritually. And um, I believe that the soul clearly is um, in a place of fullness and wholeness. So um, there's probably an and both there as our journey towards our fullness and wholeness. And then our, you know, when we reach enlightenment or our fullness and wholeness and what that might look like or glimpses of that, you know. So, yeah, yeah, I hear you. I, I, I believe that as well. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, an interesting perspective, which also has been taught uh, that life is everything, the opposites and um, not knowing might be the ultimate truth, <laughs> the mystery, <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right, the right. unknown. We can right. only know what we know when we know it. <laughs> so true, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So another big word, it's consciousness. Do you connect this word to the soul, spirit, mind, creator, source? Well, sure. I mean, in, um, I, I were, I'm trained in spiritual psychology, so we talk about consciousness a lot. And there are levels and layers of consciousness. You know, there's our subconscious mind, our conscious mind, our soul, superconscious is what they call that in my training. So there's lots of layers of consciousness, right? Um, and they all interact. So they're all there for a reason. They're all purposeful and they all are interactive towards our growth. And um, do they connect to soul, God, destiny, source, whatever? Yes, absolutely. That's the destiny of our highest potential. So, um, you know, we leave that supposedly and then we come back to it and that's just part of our journey. And um, we never leave it really. And then we're, it's always present, but we forget it, right? Mm-hmm. So <laughs> there's this <Yeah. laughs> constant in and out, in and out experience with that. So true. And speaking of um, truth and perhaps destinations in the moment, the word is joy to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, like, we like that one, don't we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the word itself makes me, mm-hmm. I mean, all of us, uh, if we can feel, right, the energy of the word, it just brings a smile to our faces. So joy, do you relate joy to happiness? Are they somehow the same? Wow, that's a good question. Well, I know when they look at joyful people, research shows us that joyful people have a slower heart rate. So it doesn't mean that they're always like, you know, "Ah," you know, wide open, crazy like that. It means that there's a calm, happy, um, maybe a demeanor 
that they can tap into, like an underground river of joy, always present, um, that's accessible. So that's my experience of joy. And bringing joy in as something that can be, um, I feel like it's a larger net than happiness. You know, one of, one of my teachers, Marcy Scheimoff, talks about it is like happy for no reason. Mm-hmm. That, okay. that would be joy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I love that. I love that, that, that thought is it's a, it's a larger net than happiness. Happiness is more fleeting and joy is more, more present mm-hmm. um, and sustainable. I heard of that before. I think there's a, it's a book too, right? It, was, it is. Yeah. yeah happy mm-hmm. for no reason. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you love most about being a woman, being in a female body? Oh, isn't that a cool question? <laughs> yeah. yeah um, <laughs> well, I think the female body is beautiful, but I, I mean, physically speaking, but I also think that the consciousness of relating and relationships You know, women are so wonderful overall in general, not all women, but in relating and and, and really putting relationship as one of the highest goals for life. And, you know, women who don't have healthy relationships are unhappier, right? They are. It's it's very, very true. And that doesn't mean just a relationship with a person. That could be their relationship with their soul, a relationship with their selves, their own self-love. You've written plenty on this, I know. And then their own relationship with others, but they're all important relationships. So I believe women, I love being a woman because I I believe we see things in a relational context and that that's a very powerful gift that we offer the world. And it gives us a lot of power to step into something and help create more health in the world and and more joy and more love. You mentioned that some women are not in alignment with those qualities of what is to be a female as we understand so I'm wondering why you have some ideas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good question. These are questions that I hadn't thought of in a while. Mm-hmm. So it, women that aren't in alignment with being a woman, well, you know, there's so much gender fluidity right now. Mm-hmm. And that's a good thing. I'm, I'm not judging that at all. I think gender fluidity is wonderful. And that the, the concept woman almost boxes some women mm-hmm. in. True. Um, so they are, get tired of that. And so I believe that freedom to identify and navigate who they are is super important um, and seeing themselves even larger than a gender. But, you know, I'm, we're talking more traditional, stereotypical, masculine, feminine qualities and roles. Um, and we all have both. We all have masculine, we all have feminine, and then we all have that part of us that's beyond masculine and feminine, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so that's a good thing too, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and speaking of freedom, what is freedom to you? What is to be free? Well, I just had a a great session with a client today and we were talking about the things that had entrapped her. You know, usually those are things that make us feel shameful or or guilty or bad about ourselves or uh, really afraid. And so we were clearing out some of those shame, shame stories that she had that were sabotaging her success. And one of the things that came up for her was that, that in that cocoon stage, um, that she couldn't see herself. And there's a part of her that still can't. And so her freedom and her ability to know herself as something that was divine and magnificent and powerful and had choice and was not trapped. Um, instead of feeling trapped and choiceless or traumatized, you know, that's the definition of trauma, right? Mm-hmm. So, right. so beyond trauma, we're free. We, we are divine. We are uh, magical. We are powerful. And how do we help people get to that inner freedom so that they can experience the outer world as more free? Which I think it, it, we, have that, we need that inner alignment so then the outer world becomes a different experience. The current situation, we have been through a lot this year. Oh, God. (laughs) Right. At this time, what do you think is the world's greatest need? To get beyond the drama triangle. I mean, I've studied it my whole life, and it's one of the most powerful things I can teach my clients. The drama triangle is so, there's no, there's nothing to win in the drama triangle. Um, persecuting, blaming, feeling victimized. They're all stages of growth, but we are stuck in, we're stuck in a drama triangle. Uh, as a culture, right? As a culture, yes, which creates a dysfunctional family. So we're, we're, we're in a dysfunctional culture of drama and it feels like truth to people and it's scary. And so drama is not truth. Drama is drama. It's not truth. So we getting beyond the drama triangle and into what truth is, into what reality is into what love is, a true love. 
and into what true power is. I, I think that's our biggest calling right now and getting out of that victim persecuting um, place that, that our society has, has, is, has, sees as a good thing. That's the scary part. There's a lot of people that see that as a positive thing. And I know there's a lot of us that don't. <laughs> right. Yeah. But get, getting beyond that and healing the wound of our, our, our nation. Yeah. Well, what a great answer. And I agree 100%. I have another question now since we talked about culture this being imbalanced or out of balance. Uh, so I'm wondering if you know any culture in the world that it's in more harmony, that lives in balance. Well, there are a lot of cultures that that are in that flow state. You know, they talk about in happiness research, that flow state of more joy, more uh, justice, more love, more present moment awareness, more connection with nature, more uh, family and relational oriented instead of just achievement oriented. There's a lot of benefits for those. There's a lot of research around the flow state and how do we achieve that, right? And so, yes, there are many cultures that are in that flow state um, and have, have those values higher than we do. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. I believe we need a lot of that medicine here uh, so that we can heal, you know, and, and until we get that relationship with the environment and the relationship with something higher than us and the relationship with others out of respect, love and joy and appreciation for each other and diversity, we're missing that. We're missing the medicine in that. And it's so it it will create more harmony and more flow and more joy in our culture if we can if we can get those medicine medicinal messages. <laughs> right. Wow, that's a beautiful way of saying. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Can you name some of these cultures? You know, they were all in my mentor Marcy Shymoff's movie. Uh, flow. It was about the flow mm. state, happy for no reason. Mm. Um, and I'm trying to remember which I want to go right now, as you're saying it, <laughs> which oh. ones they were. Um, oh, wow. So let me write this down too. So yeah, can watch no, that. Trying, yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. She did a lot of research on what makes people happy um, and that the cultures and she did, researched it all over the world. And it was the cultures that had more of the flow state which is that ease and grace. And I, I can't remember which one she, that, that were on the movie. It's been a while since I've seen it. But um, I can think about cultures I've visited, you know, that, I mean, there's problems there, clearly, just like there are here. But they, they, their um, value structures were very, very powerful and very, very much in alignment with what could create a flow state for, you know. So um, I can't name, you know, I know I went to India, for oh, example. Yeah, right. Yeah, and they have they have a huge calling for that kind of uh, um, relational at those relational aspects as well as the spiritual aspects. Um, everywhere you turn, you know that's their top priority in the majority of India. But then you've got your problems there, right? You've got your pollution, you've got your emotional issues, you've got your psychological misunderstanding, just like we do here. So you know. I don't know if there's a perfect culture out there. Um, <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah, they might not be perfect, but I love the idea of the reminders, right? At least they are trying to remind us what life is all about. Yes, yes. But you look at the Aboriginal um, cultures of that are really connected to the earth. Um, some of those um, tribal cultures still have some of that medicine that we need to learn from. Love. What is love to you, mm. Shannon? Oh, goodness. We, we've said a lot of those things already, but <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, just that um, that ability to access the a knowing and a, and a level of consciousness that's that's larger than us. And I believe I'm talking about more unconditional love and that sense of acceptance, radical acceptance of what is and the ability to connect with the beauty in that. Mm, wow. I love that. I talk a lot about unconditional self-love and I wonder how realistic that is. And <laughs> what's well, not an achievement, it might be a practice for life, right? Mm -hmm. Shannon? Well, this may be another and both, you know, as you and I were talking about earlier, we have conditions and expectations for ourselves. And then we have the ability to get to the unconditional state of love for ourselves. And that's what actually creates the transformation. Mm, right. Right. So how did you become a writer? Mm. As a child, I loved to write. It was one of the ways that I moved energy and transformed my pain. Um, and I moved, I wrote poetry. Uh, and I loved it. I loved it. 
I would sit for hours and write poetry. And most of them were more about suffering, you know, but as I grew older, um, I began to appreciate just beautiful poetry. Um, And then um, then I started writing books um, and learning the art of that. You know, that's a whole process in itself, as you know. Um, But it's it's a it's a it's a process of the heart. And it's it's a it's a wonderful thing. um, Yeah. I often say that there is a, a deep connection between writing and healing. Mm, right? I like that. Yes. Yeah. It's so yes. deep and so transformational for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, I think they did a study in Harvard. If you write something down that's bothering you even for a short amount of time, you will feel some relief. Now, it doesn't mean you keep writing it over and over and over and over because that can create more trauma. You know, but there's a certain amount of time. I believe it's it's no more than 20 minutes, maybe, if you're writing about something that bothers you, that you actually will find relief. Yeah, it has been my experience for sure in the past. Yeah. Yes. Another question I have for you is about your title is the Joy Doctor. I love that. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Absolutely love that. So, how did you come to discover? that or how did that discover you in a way (laughs) (laughs) right actually somebody named me that Mm -hmm. I I didn't even name myself that someone that I was working with said you are the joy doctor that's one of the highest callings of the soul and that's what you are and I was like oh my god I love that so I just took it on and ran with it (laughs) so (laughs) um and I just started doing more research on joy because yeah you know one of the tallest callings of the soul is joy uh, so I just thought, wow, I love that. That feels right. That's what I would love to focus on. The rest of my days, you know, I'm a trauma therapist. I can do trauma work till the cows come home. You know, I could do that all day long, <laughs> but we move from trauma to joy. That's where we go, right? We don't just stay in the trauma. That's the whole point. So if there's a destiny in spiritual psychology, we're moving from trauma to joy. Um, and that's what we want. Joy, freedom, love, unconditional self-regard, those kind of things. So that's how that landed. Someone just called me that and it's, and it stuck. Yeah. What a beautiful <laughs> title. I love, oh, love, you. love that. And, and my coworkers will laugh. Every, every time I've been in an office, we, we laugh so much in therapy. <laughs> oh my gosh. We get in there, we're doing a process on something <laughs> and we can't help but laugh at ourselves. You know what I mean? There's yeah. a certain way that that is such medicine for our soul and I mean, not for our soul. Our soul doesn't need medicine. It's already got it. But right. <laughs> for, for our wounds, right, that we need that laughter. And so we get in these processes and we just laugh and laugh <laughs> at certain things. And it's really healing. So I think that's where part of that came as well. As people were teasing me, they could hear us laughing, my clients and I, <laughs> in the room. Because you just have to. You just have to laugh at some of these things. They're just they're just ridiculously ludicrous, the, the tangles we get ourselves in. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, that sounds like fun to me. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. So when we speak of joy, I noticed not just the word, but the state of being or state of mind or state of consciousness of joy has a lot to do with gratitude. Would you say that too? Yeah, absolutely. You know, gratitude is a state of being that, again, is that radical acceptance, right, of what's happening around us. Um, So, yeah, I believe they fit in the same sandwich, you know. (laughs) Acceptance, yeah, gratitude. Yeah, yeah. and I think that when we try to force gratitude, sometimes it doesn't work. You know, they did a lot of research on, you know, writing a gratitude list works to a point, and then there's a point to where, we're kind of mad about that, you know, and, we, and, we, and we're like, I don't feel grateful right now. I'm trying to force it, you know? Yeah. Um, and so we have to honor where we are at, along the journey of gratitude. And if we're not feeling grateful, we can practice gratitude, of course. But we also practice being where we are and the radical self-acceptance of that and loving ourselves. And then we move into gratitude naturally. I often ask the question, how do we know when we are being authentic? Good question. You know, sometimes I will get truth bumps and that's a really nice thing for me when I know we're onto something really powerful. That may be more about a truth, but authentic. How do we know we're being authentic? I think it just feels right in our being. You know, it feels like we're not masking, we're not pretending, we're not in defense or covering something up. We're more open and available and... um, it, it feels 
honest. It feels uh, real. So it feels honest. Yeah, that is, um, yeah, that's the, might be the key word in real, right, to us. You say harmonizing the subconscious mind with the conscious mind and then the super conscious mind is the key. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> so there are so many yeah, terms. So talk to me about them. The subconscious, conscious and super conscious. Yeah, those are just terms, you know, we can use them lightly, but they do identify a process. So like a process I use with clients, we would we would open the doorways to all three of those levels so that we can access our whole self. It's a whole self process. So our subconscious holds all of our old memories, our reactions, maybe our old uh, beliefs about ourselves, the things in our body that uh, feel painful and hard. It's like our memory storage place, right? Um, it can also hold some very beautiful things. And so it, it, it's a storehouse for us. And so that's where we want to go. We want to know what the body has to say about things. We want to know what our emotions have to say about things because they're stored in the body. And then we want to work with those so we can move those things up to the conscious mind. You know, um, again, Carl Jung said, until we make the subconscious conscious, it will direct our life and we will call it fate. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to get in there and get to the subconscious level of a client or our own selves to get those truths to come up and out. Then when we make them conscious, we can work with them with more of our our brain, right? Our, Our adult self, our choice self. So then when we have that, we can choose to let in the soul self. And so they all three work together. And when we let the soul self in, our wiser knowing mind, our higher self, then that part brings in the healing. And, you know, I have some clients that call that their Holy Spirit comes in, or they call that um, whatever they, whatever their spiritual tradition, you know, a goddess comes in for them or Jesus comes in. You know, I had a, a Christian pastor one time and he called in Jesus in the session and boy, the whole room, you could just feel the energy of it. It was very powerful. People that have a really strong spiritual lineage, um, you can feel that when they call that in. Uh, but it's really a cool thing to see those three levels and layers open up to each other and then reconnect to some truth and rewire the system so that you realign with this ability to access your more authentic full self and bring in things that you haven't been able to access before. It's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the uh, subconscious mind and the conscious mind, they block or well, they could be blocking the superconscious. Yes, they could. Absolutely. The conscious mind gets caught in repetition, overthinking, uh, on and on and on. I love that saying, uh, when the mind settles, the soul appears. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so it's like this, so there's truth there, you know? So we really have to work with our crazy mind That's so true. that it, it doesn't disconnect us from all the beauty, all the wonderful things, right? Oh, so. yes. So that brings me to the question on how to do that? Like, do we need professionals like you to help us or can we do the work ourselves? Yeah, I think it's an and both again. Um, The, uh, some issues are so deep and painful and overwhelming to the nervous system that we need a professional and to do processes and hold space that can help us hold the truth and the support we need to actually let something go and transform it. Now, There are other things we can do ourselves, like meditation, for example. As we know, meditation opens up the doorways to these levels of consciousness as well. Um, And it trains the mind to settle. So it it gives us gives us access to our higher mind and our brain. You know, meditators have a much larger frontal cortex. They're more creative, they're more engaged, they're more present. There's so many great advantages, as you know, to meditation. So all these things we can we can do those kind of meditations on our own, and that will bring in the uh, the uh, soul. However, if we work with a professional, sometimes it's faster, you know, because two, or two people are gathered, right? So that can bring a powerful synergy to the healing. I agree. Yeah, absolutely agree. Some of my deepest healing, I'd say, sessions. They, yeah, they were sessions. I had somebody to help me. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. 
So it's, it's both. It can happen and, and both, but we don't have to suffer alone. You know, I really tell people that it's like, get some help and it's not that long standing. It doesn't take forever to get these things cleared out. It really doesn't, you know, if someone's willing and they really are ready, it can, it can go very, very fast, three to six sessions, you know, and you've, you've, you've rewired a whole new pattern into your life for abundance, for joy, for love. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. What makes us ready to heal? Yeah, gosh, that is such a great question. I think crisis often, unfortunately, crisis or trauma um, humbles us and it cracks us open. So when we crack open, we're like, oh my gosh, what in the world? We didn't see all that. (laughs) (laughs) I love the way you make it really sound, yeah, fun, the the process Uh of healing even. Yeah, I mean, oh my gosh, here we are, right? You know, cut down to the bone. We feel just totally naked. And we're like, I didn't see that until now. Oh my gosh, right? (laughs) So um, we don't listen. We don't listen deeply sometimes. We just push and run and go and do and blah, blah, blah. So uh, sometimes we we won't slow down until we're forced to slow down. Yeah, unfortunately, you're right. Big suffering. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it comes from joy. Sometimes it comes from an aha, incredible peak experience that we've had that changes our lives forever. You know, that's what got me on this path is my suffering maxed out to the level to where I had a major peak joyful experience where I've I felt the love. I felt the presence. I felt all that. And boy, that was motivating too. So, you know, it can, it can come on both ends. I love the um, section in your book, the 11 callings of your soul and the ways to embody them for your divine alignment and more. So, and you have a list of them, strength, freedom, creativity, control, connection, acceptance, reciprocal love, peace, trust, unconditional love and joy. Do you want to talk to me for a moment about the 11 callings of our souls? Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are the real needs or the callings of our soul that we all are aspiring to, um, according to spiritual psychology. And when we are able to access these into our lives, we're able to experience more of the dreams and desires and of our calling here on this plane, right? So... Um, And we need all these, right? If you look at them, we need strength. We need freedom. We need this creativity. We need some positive control in our lives, choice and power, right? We need connection and reciprocal connection. We need acceptance, reciprocal love, peace. We, I used to study with this monk and he said, peace was the first sign sometimes that we were connected to our higher self. Um, and then trust, right? I mean, we all need trust to make it in this world or we, we, we turn on ourselves and we create a lot of suffering, um, unconditional love and joy. So when we access these um, levels of consciousness, uh, we can reach enlightenment. So um, lightening up, I think enlightenment's right, lightening mm-hmm. up. Right. <laughs> we can. Oh, wow. Yeah. You're making me to ask that question. What is enlightenment? But you already answered, right? Lighting yeah, up. I, mean, I like that. We, we could lighten yeah. up. We could lighten up and, and see more from a bigger picture perspective. Instead of being stuck on one tree, we can see more of the forest of what's happening. And we're wiser, more loving and strong. And, and those are, those are qualities that we all need right now in this crazy world. So, um, yeah, embodying our soulful self is uh, it's, it's a pretty cool thing. If we do the work of paying attention to our dreams, would that be the subconscious mind? Yes, dreams talk to us, especially those clients that bring in their repetitive dreams. There's something in there. If you're having a repetitive dream, there's something for you, whether it's a fear that you need to address and work through, whether it's um, information and wisdom that the some part of you is trying to tell you something, dreams will also show you where you are in your life, like the more authentic truth of where you are. (laughs) They will will tell you. Um, So dreams are very symbolic and they're very powerful. And so if we, if we take our dreams seriously, they become our friends and our teachers. So writing our dreams down right when we wake up is a wonderful way to get started with that. And then looking at the imagery and the symbols um, I have a very simple dream interpretation exercise I use with clients, and it's there's always nuggets of wisdom and power and bringing things to the conscious mind that we can work with, right? In the in their dreams, so it's it's wonderful. Would we be able to see these symbols and images 
in our awakening hours? Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, in the work that I use, uh, we call it almost like inner art therapy, that these patterns have images and symbols to them. So uh, the, the images and symbols, I uh, love that saying, if you want to know what your soul wants, look at your images. Um, so for an example, I know, we, I know we're running out of time, but I'll tell you the quick, quick story. When I, uh, years ago, when I, I saw this old pattern of mine and I looked like a mouse with football pads on, like this teeny little mouse, and I had these huge football pads and I was carrying the weight of the world. I was carrying everything on my shoulders and I felt like this little mouse that was overloaded, right? That was the image that I got for that pattern. And when I was able to let go, I saw these open hands and they were these, these huge hands and they were holding me up. And it was this major, uh, much more receptive vessel uh, allowing things in with support instead of me having to carry all the weight of the world. So it was this shift from that image to that image. And that was a whole different pattern in my nervous system, a whole different pattern in my mind and a whole different belief system around that. And I adopted a different attitude based on that image because I didn't feel like I had to carry the weight of the world this little mouse that I was, right? Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> oh, that's cute. <laughs> does, that, does that make sense to you? You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like a playful way. You know, it's imagination. Einstein said imagination is a preview of life's coming attractions. You know, imagining our way to our soul. You know, it's creativity. It's inner art therapy. You know, children know this. They draw things and you see things in them, you know? Um, so we using our imagery is very, very powerful. It's a wonderful way to connect to our soul. So I have a few more questions for you, the final questions. Would you like to add anything or read a passage in your book? Let me add one of my favorite quotes I'll leave you with um, that's from spiritual psychology that, I, that really has been a, um, a guiding light for me um, and hopefully it can help others as well. Uh, but it's one of my favorite quotes by Carl Jung. He said, in all chaos, there is a cosmos. In all disorder, a secret order. Um, and what that means to me is that there's always a way out of something. If we're struggling, if we're trapped, if we feel overloaded, if we don't think we're going to make it, law, whatever, 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 right? That there's always a way out. There's always a way out of the chaos. And so finding that way with that alignment within so that we can have more money, more joy, more power, more abundance, more love, whatever it is that we're going for, um, is, is the goal of spiritual psychology and allowing ourselves to open up to that secret order, which is what he called it, the secret order of, of the soul. Like what's it to call the secret order of the soul, right? The soul has an answer. Yeah. Wow. How wonderful. What a yeah. beautiful message and much yeah. needed yes. for all of yes. us. Yeah. To yes. hear. What was the hardest lesson to learn about yourself in life as of today? The hardest lesson for me, <laughs> gosh, <laughs> that fear is not real. Fear has riddled me my whole, for decades in my life. Um, and I'm not saying it's not real as in it's not an experience, right? Right. Um, but when I've experienced things like peace, love, joy, um, unconditional love, that that is more real. It's more real than fear. You know, fear is a construct of energy that, uh, that, that has, um, it creates a lot of suffering. Yeah. Um, Wow. And so it has, it has been definitely my greatest teacher, but it's not um, a quality of the soul. It wasn't on my list, right? We just did that. It <laughs> wasn't on the list, but, <laughs> but it can help us like manure to our garden. <laughs> <laughs> right. I love the way you say that too in the book. Oh, yeah. It can help us get to our soul to bloom those beautiful flowers of the soul. However, too much manure burns the garden, right? <laughs> so too much fear ruins the joy, ruins the love, ruins the uh, beauty. And working with fear has been probably one of the biggest challenges of my life. Right. And greatest teachers. When we are connected to the truth of the soul, it doesn't necessarily mean that all fears will go away. Right. No. I mean, we're in this body with uh, things happening around us and surprise things at times that we don't expect. And so... Um, we have to navigate fear and feeling safe from within. I think that's where I finally got to with my own fear is we can feel safe from within. 
it's possible and powerful. And that's what feels so yummy if you've had fear as an issue in your life is that safety and that wonderful feeling of connection with the self is just such a joy when you haven't had it, when you've lost it, you know, to refine that again. What is another word for healing? Boy, it takes me to a quote on healing. Healing healing is letting go of what is not needed and becoming present um, to the truth. I just made that quote up, but it's reminded me of an old quote that I knew and somehow I made that ending up. But that makes sense to me because letting go of what's not needing, softening and opening to the present moment and allowing in what really is, is next for us. Two more questions. If you knew you would die soon, meaning losing the body, would you make any change in your life or do anything differently? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I would probably work less and play more. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I can imagine, Shannon. <laughs> I would work True. less and play more. I, mean, I, I love my work and my work often feels like play. <laughs> right. but, but I definitely am a happy workaholic some days, for sure. <laughs> oh, that's a great balance, isn't it? When work it becomes is. a playground yeah, as well. Yes, I'd say most of the time it is. But some some weeks I over push myself. And so I definitely would go play more volleyball or hike or roll in the sand mm, or yeah. get my girlfriends over and we'd dance or something mm. like that. I'd do more of that. <laughs> yes, a thousand times to those <laughs> delightful moments. Yeah. Yes, mm. yes. I spend time with my daughter. <laughs> One more question. What are three things about life you know for sure as of now? Well, I know for sure that transformation is possible. Absolutely possible and doesn't have to be as hard as we think. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I know for sure that love is really the master uh, gardener of our lives and that it changes us on a deep level. Um, and so whatever we love, we become. Um, and um, so I think that's super important. And that without peace and joy, we, we lose our connection to love. So I believe that peace and joy bring us more love. So they're all related and, and it's a beautiful thing to see. So if we don't have joy, we, need a, we, we can go towards peace. If we don't have peace, we can go towards love. If we don't have love, we can go towards one or the other, right? And we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, our path will lead to that state, right? I agree. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for your wisdom, your profound wisdom. I love your joyful presence. Thank you. I enjoyed so much being with you. It was a real, I was, I was looking so forward to it because I love your mission. <laughs> oh, I love your mission too. I love your presence too. Thank you. So I do have one more question, but this is a technical one. Where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Yeah, you can go to drshannonsouth.com. And you can see my programs and my books and my trainings and all the things that I'm doing to make my life more diverse and to help others. Thank you so much again, Dr. Joy. And we'll talk soon. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Take care, dear. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Dr. Shannon South and her work, please visit Dr. Shannon South. Dot com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.